<laughs> oh, oh, uh, Alicia, let me yeah. ask you. Do you mind if that's recorded? Or re just tell me if you want to turn off the recording at any point. Oh, no, I'm, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Um, so basically, like my big thing, what I want to use in, in counseling is going to be like um, cognitive behavioral therapy or rational emotive. To me, those two things are so similar that they might as well be the same thing. But through talking, the person becomes able to rethink what they've been through. And that's what the, that's what the author is talking about, but there's not, it's not a talk therapy. Um, I like the way he described the emotional body language, you know, because the tone of voice and the vocabulary somebody uses and the body posture are all parts of that body language, but those three simple things are enough to trigger an episode in somebody who has had a traumatic experience. Just the slamming of a door. Or, I mean, and for me personally, I would get uptight and just wait for the other shoe to drop because that means something is about to happen. Um, parts are not just feelings, but distinct ways of being with their own roles in the overall ecology of our lives. And to me, these parts are the archetypal natures that we're talking about in goddesses um, and some of the gods. And then are we true to each part? Do we take care of each part? Because each part is only one element, it must be balanced. And balance is a big thing for me. Um, emotions cause different parts to become dominant over the others and take over not just the other emotions, but I mean the other parts, but the rational thought process. So. Good. Yeah. This is, it's all I will say is that, do you understand how philosophy fits into this? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because the philosophers will give you the big picture, like how the kid ought to have been raised. And then here's how you deal with when there's a block, when something breaks or something gets uh, directed in the wrong direction and then how you have to lead it back. But the philosophy always teaches you where it is, where it is you're headed. And when you have moral relativism, where are you going with this? Like you're gonna release the kid from a trauma, but then what? right they might just go make trauma for somebody else uh, you know so the philosophers really their place is to keep the goal in view and um and that parent you know what how what a good flourishing person and society would be like and then yeah we're 10 miles from that but you shouldn't ever forget where you're going right. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so, okay, Warren, what about you? Yes, can you hear me, Dr. Beck? Yeah, can you turn on your video? Yes, I. Good. my video is on, but the thing is, I'm on my phone, and I'm about to read my document that I, the notes that I took down for the thing, so All maybe right. that is why it seems like it's paused, or I'm not there, That's okay. I'm there. All right, so for the first one that is titled, Letting Go of the Past. What? I said, letting go of the past that's that's what it's called yeah um what i said was interacting with this first reading what it had reminded me of was modern day individuals and their families majority of the broken relationships in the u.s today is a result of someone not letting go of their past experiences and bringing them forward into the present time and causing havoc on other people's lives around them in this case david was attacked by a teenage by teenage kids when he was in his 20s and now he's older and has a teenage son of his own. He's viewing his son under the light of, under the light as those kids who attacked him. His anger is, mis is misdirected. His son reminds him of those kids who he hated. And in turn, he is taking it out on his son, who was not even a figment of his imagination when he had lost his eyes, lost his eye. The incident has caused him to grow bitter and have a chip on his shoulder which also caused him to damage his home, his home environment and his relationship with his wife along with it. 
the upside to all of this is that David is cognizant of the fact that what he is doing is wrong mm -hmm. and that he needs to fix it as he does not like what he has become or what caused him to what he, it has caused him to become to the people around him. I often say that we can't drive forward by just looking in the rearview mirror or else we will crash. David was driving his car of his car his car of life looking in the rearview mirror which caused him not to see what's in front of him. It was after he sought out help, he was able to keep his eyes on the road in front of him. We as people are all guilty of this at some point in, in time, some point in time in life. But the difference between us and David is that we take glances in the rearview mirror just to see what's behind us, to remember where we're coming from. While David locked his focus on the mirror and kept reminding himself of his past until it consumed him. And what I think that the therapist did he used a little of exposure therapy, I would say, where he brought David back to the situation that he was when he was younger and he exposed him to it, asked him to recall everything that happened and all the feelings that he, were, he was feeling just for him to face his past and that he can deal with it in a sense to say, okay, this is what happened and it's not what is happening right now. And for the second part that says the mind of the mosaic, um, this was the part that I said related to something that I did on one of my classes on Wednesday night, but not in the exact same light. There's a thing they call um, disassociative identity disorder. And it's not exactly what is happening or what the author is talking about. But what I said was the main idea of this part of the, reason, of, of the reading to me is unity being able to have a unified balance in your brain that will cause you to go through life with a leveled head. What they are saying is that we all have different personalities, in quotes I put different personalities, in our brain that have different levels of reasoning and maturity. Having these imbalances, what the author is saying is best. There's a great danger though that can, co that can come from not having these imbalance. If there is not balance, there and these different parts develop into very strong parts, that is where it would cause disassociative identity disorder. Because yes, we do have different parts. We all have childish parts and more serious parts and more mature parts, but they are all part of us as one. But where the challenge for other people come in is where all those parts are individual parts of them and not a part of a whole, if that makes sense. So when they become individual parts, that's when they have switches and have this have split personality disorder because at one point you have people who even name these parts. They name the childish part, say they might give the childish part a name, Sam, and then the other part that is more serious by the name of Peter, then they have themselves that they call themselves. And I think that happens because they don't have these different parts of themselves in order and on balance. That is why they are the way they are and they develop this associative identity disorder. So that, that is my reaction for both those. Did you like reading it? Yes, I did. Because as soon as I started to read it, I was like, oh, this is what, this is, this ties into what we did in, in one of my classes on Wednesday. So I enjoyed okay. reading it. So now I have a question. Do you have dissociative disorder? Like when you're thinking about this reading, can you go back and think about my class too, right? Do you mm -hmm. see what, and attach it to what, the, the way I've approached it, right? Yes. Because, because students really are given this smorgasbord of classes that appeal to different parts of their brain. And the history behind that is that they're not supposed to be connected at all, right? Science versus religion, psychology mm -hmm. versus. And so the students basically can get that dissociative disorder just by getting educated. Yes. <laughs> do you understand that? Does that yes, I understand. Yeah. And then do you understand that my class is trying to give you a chance, right? 
just give each student a chance to figure out, well, how is it, you know, that I was raised or what I like to study or whatever, and how is it my mind works? And is that healthy or is there a better way for me moving forward? Does that make sense, Warren? Yes. yes okay. it does. What about you, Ivy? Do you have any comments yet? Um, no, not really. I was basically, uh, for what Warren was saying though, I did see where we would get our different personalities um, by going through things in life. Like maybe one, um, what is it, scenario would make you feel strongly a certain type of way that, you know, you normally wouldn't agree with if that makes sense. And maybe that's why you have an imbalance. What he was saying was basically making sense to me. I feel like he kept um, trying to make sure we were understanding what he was saying. Okay, sense. good. All right, so let's go back. And so one of the themes of this class is that we live in a culture that's been formed for many centuries, even millennial, um, many thousands of years, but especially since the enlightenment, the culture keeps cultivating a certain kind of basically, I think schizophrenia, but it works, right? You get STEM education. So, so what does this say about psychology? Okay, so we've got the Aristotelian flourishing model. And then we have Donna Zuckerberg talking about how some pretty imbalanced misogynist guys on Reddit have taken Seneca and applied it in a way which is psychologically unhealthy. So Seneca's view of tranquility of mind can sound pretty good. Um, so Aristotle's view is to be completely engaged in life and, and to seek out ways to uh, promote the well-being, even if you know it's going to get complicated and you're going to get frustrated or whatever, but you want a complete life. Seneca is more like, just make sure you don't lose your own uh, tranquility, right? Well, then that can get uh, corrupted. Um, then the next one was Augustine, where he talks about this split between eternal and temporal. Well, Mr. Uh, Van der Kolk is, you know, saying you can't live when you're disembodied like that. And so all of his therapies, he's going back to yoga. You know, he's saying, you know, those ancient people who integrated mind and body before Augustine, right? Like the Hindus and the Buddhists, like the, these guys are going back to these old ancient wisdom traditions that didn't split mind and body. So Augustine did, and then you had the article about that, you know, the problem of evil original sin, then that woman who got raised with that, and it was so psychologically unhealthy, as Mr. Von der Koch would say that, you know, like you can't have people denying the flesh. <laughs> it's just, it's going to drive them crazy, and they'll have these different personality types, and they won't be able to integrate them. So then so that was it, like the, the good part of that point of view, and then the downside of that point of view. Then you have um, St. Thomas Aquinas brought Aristotle back in to Christianity. So I was raised Methodist. I was, John Wesley, you're supposed to seek perfection. He really thought, you know, you try to be perfect. Well, of course, you can feel pretty awful, but he didn't emphasize original sin. He didn't say we're all worms or anything like that. 
So the point was, uh, Jesus said, I have come that you have life and have it abundantly. So that was the way I was raised. And the Catholic Church, actually, there's the conservative branch, which is much more dualistic and anti-birth control and, you know, really wants, is very authoritarian, especially with family relations. And then there's the liberal wing that is much more flourishing and connecting with other people and international relations and getting over religious bigotry. So, so there's the Christian tradition in the West has passed down mixed messages about your relation to your body. And so each of my students has to sort of figure out like what message did you get? Um, so this is the particular applications and some of them, Pope Francis, are very international oriented, middle class, all this stuff, toler religious toleration. And the other branch is, you know, you can't use birth control and um, marriage is between a man and a woman and you can't use in vitro fertilization and you can't use embryo and you can't, you know, it's, it's pretty rigid and it focuses on personal. And then there's just war theory. I mean, it's a mixed legacy. Um, then there's Martin Luther King. Now he's someone who took the same framework and he's Protestant, like that was the way I was raised, but he's a Baptist, but he's a Baptist that's embedded in natural law theory, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, Seneca, Aristotle. So, and I, I, my inclination is to think that the African-American church really affirmed the humanity of African-Americans and gave, you know, it was the place to go to have joy in life, to say, you know, God knows you're just as good as the white people. So they could get an alternative reality that was actually true, <laughs> where the the white supremacist Christianity was based on a lie. And so I think, I mean, again, it's a stereotype, but it's a positive one. <laughs> so that, that the African-American church, Martin Luther King represents a longstanding tradition of the church keeping African-Americans, keep reminding them that this society's wrong, you know? and you have your humanity and you can move forward. Um, so then we had um, Descartes, all right? So now we're into the modern world and that huge split because he was a mathematician and math. And this is the modern world. You take math and science, the STEM subjects, and you use it with the goal of controlling nature, right? So now you have this split and you're going to mold nature and you're going to mold the psyche. So that's where we're going with the modern enlightenment, okay? Descartes, and then we had Kant. Um, let's see, and Kant is also dualist. So Mr. van der Kolk, he's from the Netherlands. So his kind, you know, the kind of dualism that he was raised with is Calvinism, Reformed Church. And so it's a Protestant dualism, but he himself went through some real issues with all of that. Um, so then, okay, we had Kant and the, ch uh, the children, remember the uh, German children that were subjected to torture and ended up running the Holocaust. Um, so that's when you have dualism that really goes off the rails. Then we had Locke, human rights, but again, it was a blank slate and it was individualism. So now think about that, that Mr. Van der Kolk is just, you know, saying we can't, we're not individuals, we're social creatures. Like you can't just diagnose an individual in a vacuum with a bunch of um, uh, what? 
uh, diagnoses, right? A smorgasbord of diagnoses. A human being isn't just a bunch of symptoms, like they're a person. <laughs> and these symptoms arise as a result of a social network. And so I hope you understand that it was a combination of that dualism where you give yourself the moral law over here, or you have clear and distinct ideas, but it's very individualistic. With John Locke, I have a right, you know, everybody's free and equal people and they bounce around and the purpose of government is to protect your rights. And so Mr. Van der Kolk is saying, oh my God, you know, this has nothing to do with people. But he knows that those manuals and the profession in general still sees people as these little isolated monads who get these little um, problems and we're gonna try to fix that problem so they could go off and be wonderful, free and equal people again. Um, so that was the downside of all that. And then that got attached to greed and Mr. Van der Kolk, I says that, like, why is it we keep figuring out these other therapies are really working? And he said, it was moving forward until the next wave of drugs came along and the pharmaceutical industry was making gobs of money and the American Psychological Association was making gobs of money. And he's more than once, he'll say, it was moving forward in this more holistic direction and all of a sudden whammo, you know, some new pharmacological solution that focused on individuals and drug uh, chemistry without focusing on how did the family system trigger that chemistry. So, um, so greed has corrupted the, the Lockean point of view. I have a right to this and that. And so then we did um, Glenn Hedges. No, then we did happiness uh, studies. And that was the original idea was you're gonna condition everyone like a herd animal to all, everyone's gonna be happy and nobody's gonna be greedy and all that wonderful stuff. And then you have a free society, but it's of mature adults. So John Stuart Mill, higher pleasures, you know, the intellectual pleasures are by nature better. And Mill said, empathy is very natural. Well, Mr. Van der Kolk thinks empathy is really important. And when people no longer can bond with each other, psychologically, this is a huge problem. So when the David um, is reliving his past, and he can't bond with his wife or his kids. This is, you know, this is what often drives people in to see therapists is that they're not being able to bond. And so, I mean, Mill is partly right, empathy, higher pleasures, but, you know, we're not silly putty. It didn't work. Instead, what happened is all this happiness studies, which is, which turns out to be motivated by, guess what? Money. <laughs> okay, so Karl Marx says it's all about money. All that freedom stuff is about money. It's about capitalism. But if we just have this revolution and the proletariat come take over, then everything will be solved. <laughs> religion is the opiate of the people. Just get rid of religion and we'll be fine. Um, then Ruth Benedict says everything's relative, right? Mr. Van der Kolk does not think everything's relative. There's a healthy psyche and there's psyches that go off the rails. And I, you know, his job as a trauma specialist is to bring in traumatized people and then, you know, help them work out their trauma but he knows you have to return them with some yoga, with, with a lot of tools for getting in touch with their emotions and also finding a community 
various communities to bond with. Like they're not gonna get cured just with a drug. But anyway, I mean, if you have moral relativism, you don't make judgments about these things. So it's just, well, David just wanted to get fixed because he wasn't feeling very good, but I'm not gonna make a judgment about, you know, like, what do you mean? Uh, it's, he wants to flourish, he wants to be a human being. And if he wants to bond with his wife and his son, it's also, he's going to also bond with other people. It's not just me and myself feeling good about myself. It's not just me and my family as an extension of my ego. It's me as a social creature having been cut off with my humanity. And when I try to get it back, I'll be able to be a flourishing person. But that's not moral relativism. And then we talked about how slavery, why relativism is so ridiculous, because slavery is absolutely wrong. <laughs> you know, it cripples human beings. Um, and then Freud was God is the big daddy in the sky and that that's psychologically unhealthy. But then his idea of, you know, people are just sex driven, you know, and culture is just repressive. Again, you're back to that same kind of split personality thing. And so God is the big daddy in the sky is another example of a split personality. William James, the will to believe, people can believe whatever they want. Well, Mr. Von der Kolk would say that if Dave really thought that his earlier behavior was, you know, God wants him to keep his son in line. The Bible says, you know, you should beat your children if they're rebellious. He could use God to justify what's actually a psychological problem. Um, but Mr. James is so optimistic that you can believe in God, no problem. Uh, then Mr. Hedges comes along and says, our country is totally screwed up by money. <laughs> including the religion, and the religion is a function of people who have been um, abused by money, and they're looking for someone to blame, and all this stuff. So then we start with that, and now we have uh, Mr. Van der Kolk, who's actually, right, we have, a, we have a society where there's so much potential for trauma. Um, there's potential for trauma anyway, but if you add the fact that we have, that the Bush W, the Iraq war, and I thought of sending you excerpts of this, and I will if you want me to, but it was absolutely positively no holes bar driven by money. And people knew after 9-11, Dick Cheney, the vice president, they knew that it wasn't Saddam Hussein, but they had wanted to go and invade Iraq to get cheap oil. And they had wanted to do that ever since Bush's dad had not done it. And so they said in emails, let's tie this in the public's mind to Saddam so then we can declare war on Saddam. So the public will be willing to invade Iraq and we can get our cheap oil. All of those wars are related to our greed. So now we have a society where we've been at war for 20 years. And so people have come back with PTSD. Then we have a society where the middle class is shrinking where there's a lot of racism that persists in the housing, education. And so we have an underclass that's understandably psychologically imbalanced and also angry, right? So then you have police officers, the lower middle class, when the rich don't give it, don't care, they'll pit 
the lower middle class against the underclass. And so that's where you have white officers and black people in an entrenched uh, impoverished situation. You've got all that animosity. You've got all those possible trigger reactions. You have people that went off to wars for the last 20 years and they come home and they get themselves hired as police officers. So they have triggers, right? So you've got all this violence going on related to war and uh, entrenched po poor class. Then you've got kids with inadequate health care, uh, child care, uh, no decent preschool. You've got a shrinking middle class. So women with young children are going off to work. So the kids don't have high quality care when they're little. So you have all this potential for traumatic experiences. And you've got guns all over the place. Everybody's got a gun. Two thirds of those guns are used for suicide, right? And um, I, don't, I don't make a big deal of gun control. I mean, it's never gonna be take your guns, but because most of the people who, who use them did get permission, <laughs> right? They didn't had a, uh, but I don't wanna go there. It's just, that's a symptom. That's not the problem. It's what gives people, you know, an easy chance to kill each other instead of just beat each other over the head with a baseball bat or something. Um, or stab them with a knife. It usually doesn't kill people, baseball bats and knives, but guns do. But anyway, so now we've got all these traumatized people <laughs> in any number of ways. You've got women who are trying to balance little kids and careers and all this other stuff. And so they come, you know, they'll come to the trauma specialist. And um, all right, let me stop for a minute and say if, if all of that makes sense in your mind, if you think we've already been through this 50 times, you don't have to do it again, Dr. Beck, or if when each time I say it with the new reading, you can tie it in in another way and build this whole big map in the back of your mind. So just one quick comment, and then we'll go through the outlines. Um, uh, Ivy, do you have a quick comment? Okay. Um, Warren, do you have a quick comment? Yes, I do have a quick comment. Um, what, what I would have to say is that um, I remember, I think it was a week and a half ago that we were going through some readings and my whole um, focus was on greed, how we as humans are creatures of dissatisfaction. You remember when I said that a few, and then you showing us um, from our early readings about the whole greed and, whole, and the, the system, how it ties in to make the rich richer all the time. Each reading that we do, we can see that that all ties in at some point. So everything is connected. And it, it just surprised me that I really just like, that was a week and a half ago that I really focused on the whole greed thing, what it was going on in the readings from a very long time. So no, we I don't think you have to say that Oh, Dr. Beck, you're saying this over and over and over again. No, we're not going to say that because it is not only about that. Even though everything is connected, it's not like everything is connected at the same point, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. So it's, it might seem as repetition, but really it's not repetition, even though everything is connected. They connect through different channels. It's okay. not, everything is not going through the same channel. So. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to say, oh, you don't have to do it. It's the 50th time, even though well, the, other thing, the other thing I'd like it to be is that it's a hierarchy of channels, right? So mm -hmm. each new one sheds light on all the other ones, right? 
-hmm. So it's not that they're disconnected, they're connected. And yes. so all of a sudden, oh, that's a higher light to look down at all this stuff, right? And I think the term that also in one of my classes this past week, I think the term they would use for that is vertical learning, where you learn one thing and then you learn another thing on top of it to see what you have learned before and then another thing on top of it and then another thing on top of it. So it's like we're packing on to the same thing. If that makes sense. That's good because I think unless a teacher is a, thinks about this stuff, the way the system's set up is for you to have dissociation between mm -hmm. these different subjects. Does that make sense? Yes. And the way that people are asked to go in and do a study, right? I, I try to make myself into a guinea pig for whatever they're doing. But I mean, you go into this totally sterile lab and there's nothing sensuous, right? It's just like, and the guy person comes in in a coat or something. Well, what answers are you going to give? Like they're trying, they're triggering the part of your mind that's isolated from any history or any, you know, just, you know, and I, they'll ask you things just answer your first reaction don't think about it well what are you studying you know you're not studying human beings because an hour after this thing's over you start thinking about it right and so like 9 11 yeah people reacted and they didn't think right but i mean another month or two later oh it's saddam you know we're creatures of culture and we create a history based on what we think about those traumatic experiences, not the experiences themselves. Does that make sense? And the way the academy is set up with specialization, <laughs> unless somebody makes an effort and says, hey, you guys, I don't want you to graduate more dissociated than you were before, you know? Um, anyway, so good, Warren. What about you, Alicia? Oh, yeah, it's repetitive, but it's not redundant. So it's, I mean, we can get something out of it each time you do it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say stop. Okay. What about you, Ivy? Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, we're just talking about how we feel about what you're saying throughout the class right yeah um, as you've said it's all connected and I feel like each time you say it we do get a different understanding especially with that day's reading um, it gives us a different intake on it it's like when you hear something several times um, it depending on where you are uh, at that point like when Warren was saying before how we have different personalities um, and different mindsets where you are uh, at that point can determine how you take what you say what you're saying okay. so I, th I think it's good that you keep repeating yourself but it's not like redundant as Alicia was saying also each time I teach it I want to convince you that oh yeah I'm an Augustinian today mm -hmm. because that means it triggers some part in your brain that is much more holistic. And, you know, just like when the guy goes in for trauma, you have to relive the trauma, right? So mm -hmm. when you're finally creating your worldview, you have to relive, why did I used to think that way, right? Do you see what I mean? Yes. It's not just words on a paper. You have to think, what was it about your life and your emotions and all that holistic stuff that sort of you persuaded you of that. And then you then you realize, oh, I don't want to believe that. So when I have experiences like that again, I'm not going to let myself go there, which is the way trauma is, right? You relive mm -hmm. the trauma and then you realize I got to get beyond this. But then there'll be experiences that'll trigger it back in again. But if you've been through one one time of flushing it out, 
then that gets easier each time until you develop some strength of mind. But you don't develop it unless you face it, right? That you have to go back to that wound and heal it or start to heal it. Otherwise, it just gets infected, right? It just all this pus there. <laughs> and psychological wounds are just like, I think they're, they're physical wounds. And it, the EKGs, you know, it's a wound. You can spot it. It's just not something you can see with your eyes. But it's there. And, um, and can you see the analogy? Like if you ignore an, an infection, it gets pus on it. It just it gets worse and it starts to control your body. You have to release the pus. You have to clean it out and you have to let it heal. And that's kind of what I think trauma, trauma therapy is about. Does that make sense? Um, yes. Okay. So the thing that got me about this guy and the person who told me this book was my youngest daughter because it was a trauma for her when I had to move away, right? I knew that, like she's in ninth grade and her mother moves 700 miles away. I mean, <laughs> oh my God. But anyway, I, I didn't necessarily handle it because she, I kept worrying about her and she knew I was worrying about her and she spent so much time defending herself against me worrying about her that she, tell, she wasn't dealing with the trauma, right? I've got to tell my mother not to feel bad, or I've got to deal with my mother's grief. <laughs> I was like, ah. Anyway, so she's she's going to a therapist, and she the therapist gave her this book. And um, she's working it out, right? She's 40 years old. And she said, and I left her when she was 16. And um, it only is now she says to me, you know, mom, that probably upset you when, when you had to move away. <laughs> you know, because she because it's just too hard for her brain to actually, she just doesn't have enough time in her own life to, to sit, to relax enough to be able to open that up and think that thought. Does that make sense to all of you? I mean, I went through a lot of that too with having to go back when I was 40. But um, as long as everyone knows that everyone goes through it, but that's the thing that really amazes me is that this guy gets that all those ancient cultures are actually, they understood this stuff that we're just now understanding because we threw it out and now we're having to bring it back. Um, so there is, and they always have these uh, fancy names for stuff, right? Because it all has to look like a stem. It has to look like stem, it's not stem, right? And everybody knows that the whole stem culture is emotionally immature. And, you know, there's a lot of psychological issues with um, how STEM has, has come into our culture, the context within which people learn STEM or computer games for boys are, you know, shoot them up games and the kids get used to this sort of sub, sublimated aggression and violence. And then they go into computers as, as their job well, then they're good at hacking and they're good at cyber uh, war. Well, I hope they're on the right side. <laughs> but anyway, so all this stuff is this, everything we do has some connection between emotions and thoughts, but our society is, doesn't have a view of flourishing that it's founded on so that we guide how these things are put together 
instead it's just this huge hodgepodge of moral relativism and a whole, whole lot of immature people with a whole lot of sophisticated toys, um, including bombs, but cybersecurity is even more dangerous than a, a bomb pretty much. But anyway, uh, social engagement, um, the value of age old approaches, non-Western breathing, martial arts, all this stuff interpersonal memory has all these exercises like mirror exercises so the kids have to the people who have been traumatized have to sort of learn to listen to their own emotions learn how to pay attention to other people um the other thing i don't like is that fight flight thing um greek tragedy has uh literally at one point odysseus gives a choice between fight, flight, there's another one, freeze, but then the fourth one is persuasion. <laughs> ah, really? Like you might be able to persuade someone. Um, but the, the downside of the power of persuasion is it's also the power of manipulation. So when someone is traumatized, you can also take political rhetoric, oh, the big daddy, you know, vote for this person and he will cure you of your trauma. You know, he will comfort you or the big daddy in the sky, you know, God. So I would say the persuasive part is really powerful. And then the question is, how do you persuade? And so Mr. Van der Kolk is saying, you can't just sit and talk to people, right? You have to find, go back and help them revisit the pain because otherwise they'll project, they'll project this, the defensiveness or the attack they'll do to other people is done to them. So in the name of God or political unity or patriotism or whatever, there'll always be some words on top of it. Um, so anyway, the memory of trauma is encoded in your body. Um, there's, it's not just a bunch of diagnoses. Um, so let me, we can do all three of them on Monday. I did all the outlines and so we can see how they're connected, but it is amazing to me how he, uh, over and over, he says, you know, psychiatry regressed where all we dealt with were the symptoms. Well, this is analogous. This is exactly the process where behavior modification and social engineering only focused on the behavior. And because they thought it was a blank slate, they thought if we can manipulate people to have, if we different behaviors, we can cure it. And that's not true, right? We aren't a blank slate. And he's saying that trauma goes way back to the brainstem and our fear. Um, anyway, so we'll go through that. He's questioning. Um, so we did have the whole corruption. So Glenn Hedges talked about the corruption of psychology, got used to, to learn torture. It got used for all sorts of nefarious purposes. And now this guy is talking about the corruption of psychology, some of it well-intentioned, but some of it just based on greed. And then he's going back, gee, all those wisdom tradition guys, they kind of knew what they're doing. Every time we go that direction, some other way of making money comes in and undermines it. So I'm very interested in what, uh, those of you who take psychology courses have to say, because when I was in college, behavior modification was it, and I was not going to touch that with a 10 foot pole. I was not going to take a class like that because I figured out even in college that that's nobody. What I thought in college is that I look like I'm doing the same behaviors as other people, but I have totally different reasons for it. I knew that in college. And so that's bullshit. <laughs> um, okay, I gotta let you go. Warren has to go, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'll see you on Monday.
See you on Monday. I got all the outlines there. So. <laughs> See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh.